to where the last in our present season of lectures, he'd be delighted to know that was kept the best wine of the last. <laughs> Here to be saver tonight, we have the Bell Sean Bagnum. Back with us again, God knows why after the last day. But Sean, Sean has an incredible ability of putting flesh on facts and figures that otherwise may bore us to tears. He, uh, he never ceases to amaze me the way he's able to dress up flesh out and make <coughs> a human, very human story <coughs> out of statistics that otherwise would, we, we may not interest us whatsoever at all. Now before we go any further, in the event of four, follow me through the doors, up the steps, away to our left, or to the far door here to my right hand side, and just run as quickly as you can and we'll form up outside. Mm. And we'll throw a few bits of timber on the fire until the fire brigade gets here, just to keep it going. Mm. The boys get very, get very disappointed if they arrive and there's no fire. Now without further ado, we go over to Sean. Local lad made good. Isn't he looking fine, lads? And lassies. Fine creep of a man. Ken, thanks a million. And um, look, I'm very, very conscious of the fact that year after year they drag me back here to do the last lecture. I don't know what that says about me or about you, and I prefer not to go there. But thank you for having me, and I hope you enjoyed what I have to say. I'm going to talk about housing in the 1880s in Dublin. And the subject carries a certain ambiguity because there were very much three Dublins in the 1880s. There were the very rich, as there always are. There were the growing middle class in classes in the new suburbs outside the rings of the canals. And of course, there were the very poor, who by and large occupied the old city centre. And I'm going to refer to the poet, Gerald Manley Hopkins, as a kind of a metaphor for some of what was going on at the time. He was an Englishman. Uh, he lived in Dublin from 1884 until his death in 1889. On the one hand, we can talk of the Dublin that Hopkins knew through his work at the new University College Dublin and his residency at number 86 St. Stephen's Green. And we can talk of the friendship of the Dublin he knew through his friendship with the McCabe family at Donnybrook and the O'Hagan family at Holt. And these people were at the top end of what we now call the housing ladder. But we can also talk of the Dublin which existed just a short distance from number 86 at Stephen's Green and would present a very different experience from the impressions he got from the McCabe family and the O'Hagan family. This is especially so as Hopkins had had pastoral experience among similar and perhaps worse slums in Liverpool during his time as a curate at Salisbury Street Church there. Uh, and that was, that's a, a, a Jesuit church in the uh, middle of some of the worst parts of Liverpool at the time and Hopkins had served a period as curate there and it damaged his health, such were the conditions uh, at the time. But one of his poems, uh, Felix Randall, in fact, is about a blacksmith that he got to know during his time in Liverpool, in that part of Liverpool. So we can look at the life that was offered to Hopkins by the good families, the McCabe family and the O'Hagan family here in Dublin, and then look at the lives of the vast number of other Dubliners from the same period, because these were the two Dublins he would have been familiar with. We'll talk of a very different Dublin which existed for a majority of its citizens and th which through a surprising con uh, connection, Hopkins may have had some detailed knowledge. Uh, I'm going to reference a talk I gave some years ago to the Hopkins Summer School on the subject of Dublin poor and that Hopkins may have known during his residency here. He had a mixed background and it left him sensitive in the way that an outsider would feel sensitive in a Dublin where much of the local talk was of nationalism. There had been a Fenian rising in 1867 and now the great land wars were raging in rural Ireland. As the son of an East London clergyman, a Church of England clergyman, Hopkins had as a young man converted to Catholicism. And he was one of John Henry Newman's inner circle, and he became a Jesuit priest and spent some time with Newman in the Birmingham Oratory. So that he was an Englishman, 
but he had turned his back on uh, his own upbringing. He had become Catholic, and when he moved to Dublin, he was a convert to Catholicism, but he was a sensitive Englishman uh, among Catholics in Dublin, where he may have come up against Irish nationalism in one shape or other fairly regularly. So in this sense, he was an outsider and he was wary. He had become a Jesuit priest and in 1884 took up the position as lecturer in classics in the Catholic University of Dublin. This institution had been founded in 1851 following the Synod of Thurlis. Uh, John Henry Newman, as you know, was famously involved in its foundation and it had been run until 1880 by a committee of the Irish Catholic bishops under the chair of Paul Cullen, uh, Archbishop Paul Cullen, until about 1876, I think he died in 1877, 1878, and thereafter under the chair of his successor as Catholic Archbishop of Dublin. Incidentally, just to, to reference one modern thing that's been happening, it was as part of the Catholic University of Dublin that the medical school was founded in Cecilia Street in the Temple Bar area of that building, of, of, in the Temple Bar area of Dublin, and the building in which it was founded is still there. So right from the start, in university education in Dublin, the Catholic bishops wanted a medical school with a distinct Catholic ethos. However, in about 1880, the bishops started a process of handling, handing the management of the Catholic University over to the Jesuits. And it was in this period that the Jesuits appointed one of their own, Hopkins, to lecture in classics. As I said, he had been a curate, curate for a short period in Liverpool at Salisbury Street and worked in one of the worst slums in Europe there. But he had no pastoral function or duties in Dublin. He was purely a university lecturer. He lived in a garret at the top of Newman House on St. Stephen's Green, where his living conditions were counted as not good. But through the families that the Jesuits introduced him to, he partook of what passed for the good life in those days in Dublin. And he saw much of it in a middle-class, one-sided way. I want to use Hopkins' experience, as documented by his biographer, Norman White, to demonstrate to you one end of the housing story in the 1880s. I know that this group here is a particularly well-informed group, and you've heard before of the terrible housing conditions in Dublin through a long period. These terrible conditions were being remarked on in the late 1700s, and the Reverend James Whitelaw was one of the great commentators on housing conditions in Dublin in 1798, and he published his essay on the population of Dublin in 1805 to draw attention to these dreadful conditions. So there were remarkable slums in Dublin before the Act of Union. These slums grew worse through the 19th century, and it was not until the period from the 1930s to the 1960s that large-scale efforts were finally made to deal with them. And indeed it is arguable that they were never fully dealt with and housing is once again a serious issue in Dublin and we perhaps just refer to that at the end of the lecture. So I want to use Hopkins to illustrate middle class housing and lifestyle during his period. And then we will of course recap on the dreadful slums and I will use some photographs to give a visual impression of Dublin for the poorest in Hopkins time. I want to leave you with a strong impression and a strong illustration of inequality in housing then. I also want to draw some small distinction between poor housing and poverty. I am not quite sure how we'd succeed in this, but there is some evidence around about different levels of income in the poorest parts of Dublin, which I find intriguing and, and may say other things about conditions then. The McCabe family, with whom Hopkins was friendly, lived in Belleville House on the Stenorgan Road. It was a large house, as befitted uh, Dr. Francis Xavier McCabe, who was the medical director of Dundrum Asylum and was later knighted. It was a handsome house where Hopkins was comfortable among kind and hearty friends, whose son had attended Stonyhurst the secondary school, in the Jesuit secondary school in England, 
and it was through that that they came in contact in the first place with Hopkins. This house is still there. It's been painted a dark pink colour and is looking splendid even today with fresh hanging baskets along the front wall. You can see it. It's on the Stalorgan <coughs> Road, just on the Stalorgan side of Donnybrook Church and it's directly across the road from Donnybrook Bus Garage. And on the site of that bus garage, there was an old quarry filled with water where Hopkins in the 1880s messed about in a punt yeah. with the children of the McCabe household. So there you are, it's as immediate as that. The friendship of the McCabes was important to Hopkins. He was welcome here. They were outgoing and extrovert, and there is some evidence that Hopkins was a bit of a depressive and could be moody, so he needed that sort of company. And White, Hopkins' biographer, has noted that Hopkins needed such a lively model of normal secular life. And it's even reported that Dr. McCabe even once prescribed champagne for him. <laughs> also, the McCabes were strongly Catholic with their Jesuit education and were safely loyal. So this is the important thing that Hopkins wouldn't feel like an outsider. And he would normally walked from Stephen's Green just about every Sunday out to McCabe's for his Sunday lunch and back into Stephen's Green again on a Sunday evening. And some evenings, he even played the piano for them. And on one occasion, it's recorded, and it's recordable apparently, that he tried to sing. <laughs> so there you get a picture of, of the life he was leading uh, with Dr. McCabe and his family in Donnybrook. Judge O'Hagan lived on the south side of Hope Head, Holt Head in a house called Glenny, Glenavina, and like many legal families, O'Hagan's had a good library from which Hopkins borrowed books. Again, these people were strongly Catholic, and as a member of the judiciary, O'Hagan was self, uh, safely loyal. So again, you have this picture of a well-off family, educated, and what we would now refer to as castle Catholics, people among whom Hopkins could feel safe and secure. Both of these families lived in parts of Dublin which could offer our poet comfortable accommodation with the lifestyle of the upper middle class Victorian respectability. And at O'Hagans, just think about it, <coughs> apart from borrowing books from their library, he could also read the names of the ships entering and leaving Dublin port through its telescope set up in, in the living room of their house with these fabulous views across Dublin Bay. So you're getting the picture. There's how one part of the population of Dublin <coughs> were living at the time. Hopkins was also friendly with the Cassidy family, the wealthy distim distilling family who lived in Monaster Evan in County Kildare, and he travelled there regularly using the train service. So again, you're getting the picture that there was this middle-class life going on in Dublin. These, then, were the versions of Dublin that we know Hopkins experienced through his friends. At this time, also, the suburbs of Dublin were being expanded, both in terms of houses and in terms of infrastructure. The new suburbs of Ratmines, Ratgar, Ranelagh, Dartry, and these other places around them were being built. And these were middle-class suburbs. And it was at this time, also, that new water supplies and main sewage lines were being installed. The health benefits of these were well recognized long before the 1880s. There was a political demand for them and it's 1870s, 1880s that the uh, finances became available to start seriously spending on these. At an earlier time, when the Grand Canal was under construction in 1765, the Corporation of Dublin took a supply of drinking water from it and by 1778, this supply was completed from the Grand Canal Basin, uh, at the, just uh, behind the top of James's Street. Similarly, and later, a supply was taken from the Royal Canal near Broadstone, and later still, yet another supply was taken from the Grand Canal at Portobello, and this supply became operational in 1812. But river pollution had become a worsening problem. And in 1812 also, when, when the Portobello water supply became operational, an important gentleman called Park Neville was born. 
and he was to become a giant of modernization in Dublin. An engineer, he was appointed to be the first full-time Dublin city and uh, surveyor and later engineer. He extended and improved the drainage system in Dublin, but he is best known as the designer and builder of the Vartry Water Scheme, which is still the main supply of drinking water to Dublin, when you think about it. The other giant of the 19th century was Sir Charles Cameron, born in 1830. A doctor, he later became the chief medical officer to Dublin City in 1880, and he campaigned relentlessly to improve public hygiene in Dublin and to improve the living conditions of the poor. In fact, in 1885, it was he who persuaded the Prince of Wales, who was then on a visit to Dublin, on or about the 18th of April 1885, to visit some of the slums on Golden Lane and Chancery Street in Dublin. During the late 19th century, a circle of independent townships had grown up around Dublin. And one of these, Ratmines Ratgar, decided late in the century to build their own water supply and an act of 1880 gave them the power to do so. Subsequent to this, the new reservoir was built at Bordabrina and the township of Ratmines and Ratgar became one of the most elegant suburbs around Dublin with main sewage and with its own independent water supply. This suburb was only a short distance over the canal from the centre of Dublin and it had a regular omnibus service linking it to the centre of the city. Uh, be but before getting the Borna Greener Reservoir built, and I'm sure you realise this, they litigated with the mill owners along the dollar, ensuring that as a result that the drinking water needs of the township and the control of flooding in the dollar did not leave the mill owners short of supply for use in their industrial processes. So the infrastructure needs of a growing city were being looked after. The townships and the corporation were increasing the supply of water and were in the, in the process of improving the disposal of sewage. But they were doing little or nothing about housing. We have seen that Hopkins lived at St. Stephen's Green and had access to the best of Dublin middle class life at McCabe's and O'Hagan's. An even shorter walk than that which took him to Donnybrook would have taken him to some of the worst slums in, Europe, slums in Europe at the time, and we will now look at that. We are lucky that in 1885, the third report of Her Majesty's Commissioners for inquiry into the housing of the working classes was being compiled. In the worthy manner of such tribunals, and we are familiar with these institutions, evidence was taken from a large number of experts and other interested parties. One of the parties giving evidence was Hopkins' friend, Dr. Francis Xavier McCabe, who had served for a number of years, apart from being the medical director of the Dundrum Asylum, he was also the inspector of the local government board for Ireland. I will look both at the housing conditions described in the report of the commissioners, and I will then take a short look at the evidence of Dr. McCabe. If we had time, and I'm not going to do this, there were two other reports in the same decade. First, a report from 1881 80, reported on the city's sewage, and it was a report prepared by the city engineer, Park Neville. Secondly, a report from 1886 dealt with the markets and the conditions in the various food markets in Dublin. In connection with housing conditions, uh, I, I won't have time to look at it, but I'd also recommend you to look at some of the work of Dr. Jacinta Prunty uh, of Minute University, while Kevin Cairns, and there's a copy of it there, has put together a delightful book on Dublin tenement life, containing many photographs dating back to, the, to 1890 in many cases. So they give us a visual record of the streets as they were when Hopkins walked them, and I have put together a collection of large and temporary photographs to show you. And again, these photographs, uh, I, I set out not to make this one side, but these photographs will show you uh, two sides of Dublin in those days. First of all, there's a photograph of tenement housing on Chancery uh, Lane, just off Golden Lane in, in the centre of Dublin. This street is within 200 yards of the back gate into Dublin Castle. Um, Let's see if I can work this thing. This particular picture 
Uh, that's it again. This is a tenement room in the coo. And this dates back to about 1890. But as you can see, there's a very rough fireplace there. There's a kettle sitting on top of whatever is burning in the grate. One table, one bed. The frame of the foot of the bed is broken. And there's part of the plaster on the wall missing there to the left of the fireplace. Very rough, very basic accommodation. And that was fairly typical of a lot of um, the poorer housing in Dublin at the time. That's the same photograph. Don't worry about it. Uh, this is a tenement room in Newmarket in Dublin uh, at about the same time. Uh, and again, the only difference here is, if you can see the photograph clearly, the rafters are bare and the fireplace has no dressing whatsoever on it. It's purely a hole in the wall and it's set into the corner of the room. Um, and that's Bull Alley in the Liberties and about 1890. Now, the thing about Bull Alley is, uh, I don't know how clearly you can see it there, Bull Alley is still there. Bull Alley ran from the end of Golden Lane down onto Patrick Street. Uh, it, was, it was not just a slum, but Bull Alley itself was lined on both sides for the entire second half of the 19th century with butcher shops. It was, it was the meat, the slaughtering centre of Dublin. And if you think about Newmarket, Newmarket even down to the present day, uh, we had sort of the remains of tanneries and of knackeries. They were basically across the road from, from Bull Alley. So you can imagine what was going on there. The animals were being slaughtered, the skins and the offal was going across to Newmarket, and all these butcher shops in Bull Alley were supplying a whole area of Dublin with their meat. Along came Benjamin Guinness, the first Lord Ivy, and he bought up all the property basically between Patrick's Cathedral and Christchurch Cathedral. And the Ivy buildings, now as you head down the hill down Bull Alley, the, the Ivy buildings are all to your right. He built them. And the left is St. Patrick's Park. St. Patrick's Park is now built on what was the worst of that slum. In other words, the housing went right up to the edge of St. Patrick's Cathedral. And it's now, it was levelled and it was, he built the park that's there. So those are the improvements he did and that was his bit of slum clearance in Dublin. But that's Bull Alley before any of that happened. Uh, that's the top end of St. John's Lane. Uh, looking at it from uh, uh, Thomas Street, and that photograph is dated to October 1888, so that's right in the middle of the period that we are. Okay? Um, and that's St. Augustine's Lane, looking towards the Keys. <coughs> so that's down the back of St. John's Lane. It's the lane through the next block. And it comes out on Usher's Quay, and if you turn left at the bottom of uh, St. Augustine's Lane, you have the multi-story car park there with the big funny-looking petrol station down. That's, that's that lane. It's lined both sides now with apartment buildings. But that was, that was part of the problem then. Now, this particular photograph is North Earl Street, and again, it's in the 1890s. Um, and in, in this photograph is kind of famous. <coughs> And it's famous for one reason. First of all, North Earl Street, a busy shopping street. You can see all these well-dressed people uh, out doing their shopping. Look at the little girl with her mother and she with her shoes and coat and bonnet and all the rest. And look at these children here with their parents all beautifully dressed. And in the middle of it all is the local ragamuffin. And the photograph is famous for that contrast. The little lad dressed in rags, no shoes, and he probably lived locally, they'd all come in from the suburbs. <coughs> and that there's a great emphasis there of, of the difference, of the contrast uh, in, in, in that particular photograph. And we're very lucky in that we have the well-dressed <coughs> children and we have the one lad from uh, the locality. So that's, <coughs> that sums up the differences, the class differences there were in Dublin. Uh, again, that's just Thomas Street, and that photograph again is, that photograph dates from 1891. 
uh, and as you can see, the buildings on the left were the old distillery building. Uh, the photograph is significant too. First of all, they're now part of the National College of Art and Design, these buildings here. St. John's Church are still being finished. Uh, they were still trying to finish off. The, that church started, I think, about 1861 or 1862. Uh, I've done a fair bit of reading about it because there was a guy called Joe Cromier. And, and his brother Dennis had a pub on Georgia Street. And Joe Cromian was the centre of one of the Fenian groups, one of the Fenian centres in Dublin. And Joe Cromian operated as a kind of a, a mafia boss. If you wanted to work on buildings in Dublin, you had to go and pay your respects to Joe in his brother's pub on George Street. And Joe would fix you up with a job and he could ask you a couple of favours and there might be favours that you prefer not to do, but you had to do them if you wanted to hold your job. And Joe was appointed the foreman to the building of St. John's Church, uh, with the result that there was always an awful lot of Fenian activity in and around the church, to the extent that in the late 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, it was known as the Fenian Church. And there's a little pub directly across the road from it, which was called Bergen's in those days. And you'll know that it's a narrow-fronted little pub right beside the entrance to, I think it's Chadwick's timber yard. And in those days, that was Kelly's timber yard. And that was Bergen's pub. And that's where Joe Cromine gathered all his workmen uh, men on a Friday evening to pay them. And that's where all the favours were done, the hatching was done, the plotting was done, all the rest of it. And there's, there are even reports of a couple of times uh, of them going there Friday evening, there were a couple of strangers there. Men were suspicious of them until Joe explained they were guys out of various regiments of the army and he was trying to induct them into the Fenians. That was all the activity that was going on there uh, during that time. So, uh, John's Church, known as the Fenian Church, uh, an important landmark in Dublin in those days. This was um, Uh, th this is one of the laneways at the, off St. John's Lane as well, just off Thomas Street. Uh, and this, this picture is from Berkeley Street, north of the Liffey. And it's on the day of a funeral. And again, it gives you the contrast, the ponies and traps, the fairly well-dressed people gathered for the funeral of some local dignitary. Um, I've thrown in a couple of pictures here. This is one of them. It's Rat Mines. Now this picture has to be taken post-1891 because Rathmines Town Hall was only built in 1891. But you see how well developed the trams were then? The overhead wires, the electric trams, they were all over done. And one of the things that uh, I think there's room for somebody to do a study on is the fact that um, you'll find that the trams served the better off areas and that the areas that the trams served stayed middle class because they were accessible and they had good public transport. Uh, this is a second one. Again, the tram service on North Circular Road. You see the good houses and you see the trams and the overhead wires are there in the picture as well. Whereas Meeting House Lane in the middle of Dublin, dark and dank and walls and no windows. Now, there you go. That's the other side of it. A couple of ladies out shopping on Grafton Street. And you can see the fine, the fine window with the fine display of glassware in it there. Uh, I can't say it was water for glass in those days. And again, um, well-dressed women, the canopies out over the shops, lovely displays in the windows. So there were always, there were always at least two doubles. Now this one is a yard in Morgan's Cottages. Uh, that building was let in tenements. And you can see that there's a pump in the yard. And uh, this is one of the, this photograph was taken in fact by, I mentioned the man earlier, Sir Charles Cameron, the medical inspector for Dublin Corporation. And as part of his <coughs> canvassing for and his report into bad housing. And this house, this was to show that here was this big house full of people and just one standing water pump out in the yard. And uh, that's, not, that's not a particularly good picture, but it's the Church Street tenements um, at, at, the, 
again in the 1890s. So there you get a picture of <coughs> what Dublin looked, at, looked like. And I think that it's clear that there were two Dublins. And in the photograph of North Earl Street, we've seen both sides of it. There were two Dublins. And I've prepared a table setting out uh, the population of Ireland and the population of Dublin City for the years from 1841 to 1881. And you can see there, the population of Dublin City rose from 232,000 to 249,000. Not a big rise. But it rose from 2.84% to 4.82% of the population of the whole island. And you can see there, a drop of almost 3 million people in those uh, 40 years in the population. If you're surprised that the population of Dublin wasn't a bigger percentage, you must remember that that <coughs> population of Ireland included the north of Ireland, so that Belfast uh, is one of the centres of population that's in those figures and is pulling some of the weight from Dublin. But you can see that Dublin held its own population-wise. There was some small increase, and yet the housing didn't improve. Overcrowding was a chronic problem in Dublin during the 1880s. And while the 1885 report deals with Dublin, it also records that there was official concern about the tenements in Belfast, Limerick, and Cork, and to a lesser extent in the other major towns. This was not just a Dublin problem. It's also reported, and, and this, this is part of Dr. McCabe's evidence, it's also reported that two thirds of the population of Dublin lived at the rate of one family per one and a half rooms. That is, 32,000 families out of 54,000 families residing in 7,200 out of 24,000 houses. The population of the Dublin area at this time, that's outside the city as well as just the city, was 340,000 people. So that each family consisted of 6.3 persons in one and a half rooms. For this figure to work, if you think about it, 16,000 families of about 6.3 persons per family lived in one room tenements. That's it in the stark figures. The commissioners, in order to remove doubt about conditions, asked a number of questions to clarify this, and they spoke of debt, confinement, sickness, cooking, work, having workshops, sleeping and having male and female family members all living together in these cramped, overcrowded conditions. When children grew up, they remained in these conditions with their parents until they formed unions of their own and found a room to rent and start the cycle all over again. The inquiry was held just at the end of a period when the corporation had implemented a system of cleaning out the courtyards and the tenements of, of these tenements on a daily basis. Water closets were being installed in the yards of the rate, at the rate of one per tenement house, but all flowed into the Liffey, and that was considered an improvement on leaving it lying in the yards of the tenements. And some tenement houses, just to give you an idea, were large and could have up to 100 people living in. Some examples of living conditions on the south side of the city in 1884 would include Peter Malidi, who lived in 43 Golden Lane. He had two of family, that's four of them, and lived in two rooms so that he had 1,317 cubic feet of space per person, and that's the way it was measured at the time. And if you take it that ceilings were eight foot high, this worked at about 164 square feet per person. He earned 15 shillings per week and paid two shillings per week rent. In terms of what we have said, he was clearly one of the better off tenants. But consider Patrick Devlin at 14 Bow Lane, just off Stevens Green, whose family of five lived in one room and had 182 cubic feet of space per person. And again, if you take a ceiling height of just eight feet, that means 22 and one half square feet of living space per person. He earned 15 shillings per week and paid one shilling and sixpence in rent. 
Consider also house number 36 at Upper Mercer Street. This was located just to the back of College of Surgeons. This house consisted of four stories and had originally been occupied by a single family. It was located not behind and not far from the house where Robert Emmett had been born. The rest of Mercer Street had also originally been built as single family housing units, but now in 1884 the entire street was reduced to tenements. Number 36 was occupied by 11 families, totaled 23 adults and 11 children, or a total of 37 people. If the maths seem wrong, that's the way the figures are represented, implying that three individuals lived in rooms who did not constitute families. 37 individuals occupied 12 rooms and two kitchens, one of which was not in use and the landlord was trying to let it. Here the total rent from the house amounted in total to one pound eight shillings and sixpence per week or 74 pounds two shillings per year and that's just under 96 pounds uh, or just under 96 euros per year and I just want to run down through the occupiers of number 36 because this is interesting The 11 families, you can see them there, one jeweller, two carpenters, a shoemaker, a bricklayer, a gardener, three porters, a jobman, and a charwoman. That's the 11 families. The jeweller earned one pound 18 shillings per week. The two carpenters were earning one pound 14 shillings per week each. The shoemaker earned 15 shillings per week. The bricklayer earned one pound 12 shillings per week. The gardener earned 16 shillings per week. The three porters, uh, their earnings greatly varied and they earned from 12 shillings to one pound five shillings per week. That's almost double the 12 shillings. A jobbing coachman who were, whose earnings were uncertain, they varied, and a charwoman earning five shillings per week in rent. And you're getting some idea of what the poor were earning. But you're also, and what I'm going to put to you a, a number of times during the rest of the lecture is that there were some of these people whose earnings could have afforded them decent housing if it was available. It simply wasn't available. And so part of the reason for the existence of, is, existence of the slums was not poverty. It was the unavailability of housing that some of these people could have afforded. And I think that's an important point to make. <clears throat> the inquiry paid particular attention to a sample number of houses, and Mercer Street was one of these. And the following summary information was assembled in relation to Upper Mercer Street. There were 34 tenement houses containing 272 rooms on the street. The 272 rooms were occupied by 240 families averaging 1.13 rooms per family. The weekly rent collected by the landlords in total of Mercer Street was 32 pounds, over an average of two shillings and eight pence per family. So that an annual rent of 1,663 pounds was being collected off this street. These were the crowded streets and houses within a short distance of Hopkins Base at St. Stephen's Green, and just around the corner, from Grafton Street, the heart of fashionable Dublin, then as now. And before I go on, um, I want to quote some of the proceedings from the Housing Inquiry of 1885, and I will explain why in just a few minutes. Um, I will start at line 21861, and that's the way the report is set out. Each, each question is separately numbered. And the question at that was, in the case of Dublin, a provisional order confirming our scheme with regard to the Coombe area and Boyne Street was issued and confirmed by Parliament in 1877. It was. And it was under a Parliamentary Act, I think either 1877 or 1879, that the Dublin Artisan Dwellings Company Limited was set up. An official representation was made as to eight unhealthy areas and the corporation made a scheme as to two of them, the Coombe area and the Boyne Street area. The estimated cost of carrying out these two schemes was £20,000. 
Then when the act was passed, the Coombe area was taken in hand. The £20,000 which was borrowed from the Commissioners of Public Works in Ireland was found to be only sufficient for purchasing the property in and clearing the Coombe area. And an additional loan of £4,000 had to be granted for constructing the new streets, sewage, lighting and giving a water supply to the area. When this was done, the area was let on a perpetuity lease to the Dublin Artisans Dwelling Company at a rent of £200 per annum. And that's the way official them dealt with. They cleared the area, they put in the basic services, and then they rented the area to the Artisan Dwellings Company to go and build proper housing on it. And uh, you'll hear now exactly what the Artisan Dwelling Company did. The number of persons displaced in that Coombe area was 984. And the Artisan Dwelling Company erected 211 houses in which 1,000 people were accommodated. So basically, they were able to accommodate all the people who had been displaced by the clearance. And that was the method used to clear that particular area of Dublin. So you can see that even at this stage, a solution of sorts was being tried out, with the involvement of a privately run company being helped with public money to provide housing and partner some clear, slum clearance in much the same way as officialdom has on the last few years used housing associations. Uh, to provide some facilities. But also similar to today, dealing with 211 families out of 32,000 families in bad slum uh, housing was merely scratching the surface of the problem. At least in the example of both, a similar number of people were housed to the number displaced. And then when you consider that in the Boyne Street, Street uh, scheme, the population of a small area was reduced from 95 persons to 37 persons. And in a further area, so <coughs> sometimes these clearances didn't deal with all the people they displaced. In the, in the, in the Coombe, they did. In the Boyne Street area, they didn't. And in a further area close to Boyne Street, the following was recorded. The area has now been cleared and the site led to the Artisan Dwelling Company at £140 per annum, yes. The Artisan's Dwelling Company are to build... Now, the Artisan's Dwelling Company then went and raised money from shareholders to finance the building that they did. That was the way the scheme was done. And they were to build 73 cottages of two storeys, 44 cottages of one storey, and 21 tenements for one family each. And that, that's the scheme that they were going to do on this area close to Boyne Street. Then there was the shibboleth, or the, the, um, the, the generalization. With regard to cellar dwellings, there has been a good deal of action taken by the corporation to close such dwellings in Dublin. And there have been great efforts taken since 1872 to close them, because the basements of tenement houses were looked on as being particularly unhealthy, bad places to live. The lives of these people can only be imagined, and Dr. Pronti has mapped the geographic extent of these tenements. We have looked at a small area just off St. Stephen's Green, and at the Coombe area in the above exchanges, and this is all recorded in the housing, uh, the, the, the inquiry into housing at the time, it's all there. But there were extensive areas of Dublin in tenements in the north side of the Liffey in the district known as the Monto. That is around Montgomery Street, the area bounded by O'Connell Street, then known as Sackville Street to the west, the North Keys to the south, Dorset Street to the north, and the Docklands to the east. And this area subsequently became notorious as a red light district. And the funny thing about that is that that's probably extending it a bit too far. Because North Errol Street ran right down to the middle of that, and we saw from the photograph that North Errol Street was a respectable shopping street. So it's probably not true to say that North Errol Street was more likely the southern boundary of the area. And in other words, what's now Parnell Street, <coughs> which would have been Gloucester Street in those days, I think, or Cottle Blue Street was Gloucester Street, I think, would have been more the centre of that area. This area subsequently became notorious as a red light district. Prostitution or sex work was widespread in this part of the <coughs> area. 
and excessive drinking was the other most conspicuous problem in all areas of Dublin. This was a major problem. During the 1870s, just 10 years before Hopkins came to Dublin, a report was prepared on intemperance. Remember, we have noted that the population of the Greater Dublin area was, become, it was about 340,000 people, yet there were 1,006 public houses, 310 grocers, 137 beer dealers, and 209 unlicensed public houses known as she beans. And I'm going to make the comment further on, if these are illegal and they're she beans, how are they able to count them? But anyhow, we, we, uh, one magistrate was heard to proclaim that Dublin is saturated with drink. At one stage, Marlborough Street, now the headquarters of the Department of Education, had 16 public houses and umpteen civilians. And it was a feature then of doing that survey on Marlborough Street that they couldn't get an exact number on the number of civilians. But then it was remarked at the time that with regard to drink, the public house is to the poor man what his club is to the rich man. The poor man's home is rarely comfortable, and in winter, the bright light, the warm fire, and the gaiety of the public house are difficult to resist. Obviously, questions arose concerning the morality of people living in these conditions. And I'm going to quote uh, Reverend James Daniel of Francis Street, who gave uh, evidence also to the um, housing inquiry in 1885. And he said, my experience convinces me of the extraordinary morality of our people in these respects. In fact, I have been brought into contact with these people for nearly 25 years, and the cases are rare in which anything approaching to gross immorality occurs in families. As to unnatural crimes, they are almost non-existent. I cannot remember to have met in my long experience with more than three or four cases of unnatural crimes. In fact, I have often been filled with astonishment, as well as admiration, at the purity of the mode of living of our people. Uh, and as I said, the deep, these comments were provided by James Francis on the same day as Dr. McCabe gave his evidence to the poor inquiry. And in a totally different context <coughs> over here, a similar comment is recorded from a sea captain of an emigrant ship in Thomas Keneally's book, The Great Shame. This was in the context of the behaviour of passengers on the long voyage to Australia in very overcrowded conditions. But you can now realise that this was in contrast to the behaviour of some people in the context of drink. But there must be another side to this particular story. And I came across uh, one example. And this is a curiosity. A History of Alexandra College was published in 1938. And intriguingly, it records a unique social experiment in the 1890s. As part of a school project, a group of girls, these are secondary school pupils now, from Alexandra College, purchased some tenement buildings. They repaired them and put them in good order, and then led them to families to observe firsthand the social behaviour of the poor in improved housing circumstances. And by and large, they were very pleased with the result, but some of the behavior was disturbing. And I quote from the book, little girls sat by the fire, rapturously nursing some dolls, while their brothers more often gave the dolls very rough treatment. One urchin was seen to snatch a doll from his sister, and after threatening to remember now that I am your husband, then proceeded to enforce his marital rights by knocking the head of the doll violently and repeatedly against the doorpost. So somewhere in the world in Dublin, he was seeing an example of domestic violence. Okay, so it can't all have been rosy. Secondly, Dublin was the setting for one of the most notorious red light districts in any city in Europe. This sex trade had two components. First, there is a demand driving it. And secondly, there is a supply of willing or unwilling girls to facilitate the demand. 
and it appears there was plenty of both in Dublin. So Father Daniels can't have been totally right. Uh, and I don't believe that Dublin was a city of saints and scholars at any stage. But isn't it intriguing, isn't it intriguing in terms of the difference between the rich and the poor, that a small group of secondary school girls from a wealthy background bought tenement houses as, an ex as a school experiment. I've never heard of anything like that before, and I just came across this reference to it in this history from 1938. I think that's absolutely intriguing. What would Hopkins have known or experienced of this Dublin, of these people, or of their conditions? He did not have passed through duties among them, but we can imagine some of the conversations between Hopkins after his experience in Liverpool with Dr. McKay, who gave evidence to the inquiry and was particularly concerned with the money being made by landlords at the expense of the occupiers of the tenements. It just gives an insight into what lunchtime conversation might have been about at that house in Donnybrook. It was confirmed that Dr. McCabe had been Inspector of Local Government Board for Ireland and his evidence um, concentrated on, he wanted to emphasise the landlords that were making money out of these houses. Dr. McCabe confirmed that there were 9,700 houses in Dublin occupied as tenements that 2,300 of these were unfit for human habitation, and that out of those 2,300 unfit houses, 1,875 had lately been detenanted and closed. Now, he, he's giving official figures. He also spoke of the profit to be made by unscrupulous landlords, and instanced a house costing the landlord 10 pounds a year to rent, and yet he was renting it out as tenements and collecting £240 a year from his many tenants. This was said to be an exceptional case, but it just goes to show the sort of money that could be made by landlords. He also instanced five individuals who owned 1,100 houses between them, yielding gross rents of £5,500 per year or £1,100 per year each for the five owners. This was the gross rent of rooms let as tenements. And some of you might be able to speculate as to who some of those owners might be. And I, I, I've been thinking about it. And a couple of the obvious ones would have been maybe the Earl of Mead Thomas. Uh, also probably the Fitzwilton estate. They would have been two totally different parts of Dublin, but they, but they would both have been renting a lot of houses. Maybe the Vernon estate in Clontarf. Uh, if we think about it, we can probably put our finger on those five people. Um, Dr. McKay was also asked some questions about the valuation system where poorer houses seem to have disproportionate <coughs> valuations. Don't forget the valuation system has always, the values of houses under the valuation system was always based on what the houses could be rented for. So that if, if tenement houses were being rack rented, then it in inevitably followed that they were highly rated. Um, the Plunkett Street area, just to give you an example, again going back to the inquiry, there are two or three questions of detail upon which I must ask you with regard to the Dublin and Cork schemes that have been mentioned just now. In Dublin, the Plunkett Street area is an area consisting of just over three acres and it contains 159 houses. In fact, it consists of three acres, two roads, 22 perches, and yes, it contains 159 houses. Think of that as housing density. And it was inhabited by 1,690 people on just over three acres. It is reported that this area was let to the Artisan Dwelling Company, who were to build 73 two-storey cottages, 44 one-storey cottages, and 24 tenements for 24 families at rents varying from two and sixpence to six shillings per week. That is 141 dwellings replacing 159 dwellings. So there's still a colossal density there being maintained. Because, in fact, those houses are still there and they're still perfectly habitable. The report also recorded that the corporation appeared to be apathetic about the housing conditions. And it was stated to be more than likely that members of the corporation were landlords of such property. The person answering the question wouldn't come out and say, yes, they were. 
all he would say is that members of the corporation were more, like, more than likely to be landlords of such property. And it was even stated that these people were frustrating the operation of the various relief packs. <clears throat> so not only was there a vested interest on behalf of members of the corporation, but in fact the corporation itself owned some of these tenement buildings, and theirs weren't always the best quality either. And finally, before we finish, I just want to give a description of a typical bad tenement house, quoted in full from the 1885 housing inquiry. The effects of the du Dublin tenements are, I believe, that the houses are very old, that the woodwork is decayed, and that it is not easy to keep them in a cleanly state. The floors frequently make a considerable angle with the horizon, owing to the subsidence of one of the walls. The floors are worn and worn-eaten, and often so patched that the patches project above the level, general level of the floors, thereby preventing the proper cleansing of the floor and that windows are frequently without pulleys to the sashes, and that they are all, all, also frequently composed of ill-fitting sashes, which in stormy weather permit the wind to blow freely into the rooms, that the panes are often patched or broken, that the staircases are often dark, ill-ventilated, and too steep, that the approach to the yards of the houses is frequently so difficult that the tenants prefer the more convenient access to the street and empty the slops into the street during the absence of the police. That the sanitary accommodation is defective, one privy or water closet being common to a dozen families and being often situated in some objectionable situation as near the kitchen, there being no yards in which to place them. That the basement stories, which have been cleared of tenants through the action of the corporation, have become in many cases very filthy. That the yards are rarely asphalted or concrete, which means that some of them were, and that their clay surfaces are often very damp, and the children who use the yards as playgrounds are liable to suffer from the dampness, especially when they are unshod, as is often the case. That too many families inhabit the same house and use a common staircase, and that when scarlet fever, measles, or typhus occurs in such a house, it is peculiarly liable to spread from room to room. And that was the evidence of Dr. Charles Cameron, whom we met early on. I was struck by the concern of the Commission and of Dr. McCabe at the extent of profiteering by landlords. While the language of inquiry such as this is always going to be temperate, you can read some very strong disapproval. I was also struck by the reference in Norman White's book to the overcrowded hop conditions that Hopkins experienced in Liverpool. In Dublin, as in Liverpool, Hopkins experienced a blatant example of the extremely poor uh, and the extremely rich living within a few yards of each other. And in Liverpool, this same overcrowding was also a feature of the slums. And remember that number 86 in Stephen's Green, and I think I stepped it one day, it's just about 300 yards from Upper Mercer Street. The hearing of the Commission I've taken most of my quotes from took place on the 23rd of May 1885. Um, Hopkins had been in Ireland since early 1884. McCabe had heard Hopkins' sermon in Stonyhurst and was drawn to seek him out when Hopkins arrived in Dublin. They made contact early in 1884 and went on friendly terms for over a year by the time Dr. McCabe gave his evidence to the Commission. Whatever about McCabe's influence on Hopkins or Hopkins' influence on McCabe, we can speculate that the cleric may have been reinforcing the social conscience of the good doctor and shaping his attitude to the poor of Dublin. One had pastoral concern for and experience of the poor in the slums of Liverpool. The other had a professional concern and experience of the conditions of the poorest in the slums of Dublin. And both <coughs> seem to have genuinely shared a spiritual and social justice based concern for these people. And finally, today we have a housing crisis. In common with 1885, it is not just the poorest who can't afford decent housing. As you saw earlier, there was considerable disparity of income in the slums of Dublin. It seems the problem was not just the condition of the existing housing, but the non-available, 
of habitable housing which many in the slums could have afforded. As today, there were various efforts to deal with the problem. As today, some of these efforts involved the equivalent of our modern housing associations. As today, there were difficulties presented by vested interests. And as today, some of these vested interests took the form of adherence to ideologies that simply did not deal with the problem on an adequate scale. Have we learned that inadequate or overcrowded housing should not be tolerated? Along with poor education, it is the major cause of poverty and disaffection and will carry long-term consequences. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, folks? Okay, so uh, thanks very much for a very interesting talk. Was there an official uh, definition of what made a house unfit for human habitation? Didn't come across one. You're quite right, didn't come across one. A lot of talk about very bad conditions, obviously unfit, but no definite definition. Yeah. Yeah. The history on the villages around County Dublin. I mean, yeah. I, I lived in uh, Cronin Village. Yeah. And it was a village when I went there. Yeah. Yeah. But it was magnificent houses there. Was, you know, things that are gone now. I mean, the, I think the churches, Protestant churches, still there. Yeah. Was there any really history of the villages? There are several histories of the villages around Dublin. Now, I can't, I can't put my finger on any of them. I know that. Uh, my group in Minute, it, it, sometime in the early 90s, published a history of villages, but not specifically around Dublin. But there are some. Somebody else here might just know more about the books, that, and there are some outside there on the history of various villages around Dublin. Yes, there are. There I'm going to have to look for them. I can't give you the name of them. There is a history written on the Dublin village. Is there? Right. Well, well, you might give this gentleman that information now when, when we're finished. Yeah. Yes. Just today, I was in Charwin Street, they're building a new hotel, massive big hotel, and there's a lot of pictures right along the hoarding. Yeah. And I noticed on one of them, in 18, 1941, it was a subscription that built one of the major blocks, which is now gone. Right. Madame French Mullen yeah. organised, she was background to it. Yeah. Kathleen Lennon and French Mullen. Yeah. And it was public subscription, and she, actually there's a letter. Yeah. Pinned to the board as well. Right, right. Where, where is this exactly? It's in Charlemont Street. Oh, Charlemont Street. Charlemont Street. Yes, Street. there is. Right. But 1941, they built it with uh, subscri public subscription from a half pound to a thousand pounds that we see. Right. In some okay. instances. Yeah, yeah. So it's well worth looking Just, just one other thing about Charlemont Street, and it's apropos nothing. I watched an interview that Ryan Tuberty did with Mary Black, the singer, mm -hmm. lately on the Late Late. She grew up in Charlemont Street. She did, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Archson's dwellings. Yeah. Um, can you give us any. How was that set up? It was obviously set up for the problem that was there. Yeah, it but was. Who, who set it up? Oh, or, I, I don't know who was involved in it. And, and you're right, because it's. it's um, it's, it's a major study in its own right, the artists and dwellings, what happened, because it was set up by an act of parliament in 1779. In the 1880s it was obviously up and running, it had raised its share capital, it was building houses and the rent was coming in. Um, it continued as a quoted company up until the 1970s, or the late 1970s, and it was still in operation. And I know the two guys involved. And around about the time of the Madigan judgment, because the rents were fixed, uh, the Act of Parliament that set it up fixed the rents that could be charged. And I think there were a number of amending acts raising the rent as, as time went on, but basically the rents were still fixed. And was it the Madigan judgment in the late 70s and early 80s where somebody succeeded in having it declared unconstitutional to control rents? <coughs> and a couple of people in Dublin saw the opportunity that artisan dwellings had these hundreds of dwellings around Dublin, all with controlled rents, and if the rents were no longer controlled, the value was going to go up. And a couple of people succeeded in buying the company on the back of that, that the judgment was going to be that way, and they made an enormous sum of money out of it. And, and that's how the artisan dwelling company ended up. Okay? But um, it, it, it was um, 
it was a solution of its time. And I mean, the build, the, the housing, the houses that were built were wonderful houses. I mean, they were, and they're still, still there, and they're still great houses. Yeah. Yes, they were very high quality indeed. And there was a good deal of care taken in choosing the contractors to build them and, and making sure they were built at the time up to a specification. Yes. And, and um, they, they, they dealt with a small portion of the problem. It really, really, the, 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 the real problem in Dublin we saw in our lifetimes being dealt with because it was starting in the mid 1930s down to the mid 1960s uh, with, with Crumlin, Drimna, Ballyfermot, and Ballymun uh, as we, the power blocks built in the 1960s, which are now obsolete and gone. They were, and that was under Kevin Boland, they were, if you like, the final solution of the 19th century slum problem. Um, but now we're going back to it again. And, you know, and, and look, it's not, it's not that people were particularly poor, it's not that they couldn't afford to put a roof over their heads. The housing supply just wasn't there to match their needs. Because a lot of these people could have afforded to rent much better than what they were living in. But it simply wasn't there. The same is happening again. And the same is happening again. And if history teaches one thing, it teaches us that we never learn. <laughs> yeah, and sadly, that's that's the case. Yeah. 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 Just uh, talking about the present time, where they're trying to levy, you know, fake insights. Was there any um, legislation to at that time to use fake insights for for no. no, no, no. What you owned, you owned, and nobody could interfere with it. Right. Uh, that was it. Yeah. Sean, my own grandparents, uh, my, my own grandparent, my, my grandfather and grandmother grew up in Stephen Street Lower, Stephen yeah. Street Upper. Just around the corner from Lower Mercer, Mercer Street. Lower Mercer Street, and yeah. indeed Upper Mercer Street. So yeah. the time of the Great War, yeah. my grandfather's address would be Upper Mercer Street. But at some stage among the Mercer Streets in the census, there's 197 people yeah. in the one building. Yeah. yeah. So conditions must have been absolutely appalling. Yeah. And that was in the yards and alleyways. Yeah, and that was a hundred yards from Stephen's Green and from the top of Grafton Street. Yeah. You can imagine, like, you know, the very it strikes you straight away. The very first guy there probably worked in one of the good jewelry shops in Grafton Street. Yeah. That would have been typical of the entire world. Yeah. Yeah. Right across the yeah. Right across That's right. That's everywhere. Right. Yeah. 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 Was this a class thing? Was it? Was it um, the people who had money didn't particularly want poor people living near them? So, was it a class stratified society at the time where, you know, the people of power? Yes, and I don't know. Are my two answers for that? It was a class stratified society. Whether it was a class thing to prevent these people living in better housing, I don't know. This is why, when it comes to say 1914, so many people. Can you, can you imagine, uh, uh, just while well, I was there, just logged on to 1911 cents, so my grandfather is 12. Yeah. And he's living in squalid conditions with his family, etc. Yeah. with a large family. Yeah. So by 1914, when he's 15, and you get this chance that somebody's going to give you clothes to wear, going to give you your breakfast, your dinner and your tea, okay, you might have to go off to this place and... France or whatever, but should there's a bit of adventure involved in that. Yeah. And if you're going to relieve the pressure on your mother and father back home, so what are you going to do on you? Going to lie about your age, join up, get a little bit of medical. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe if you're lucky, there'll be a girl on your arm. Yeah. In your lovely uniform, what in the world? Which is why 200,000 Irish men, most of whom I, I, would, I would argue that 90% of whom were from the wretched poor or the Certainly, the lower level of society at the time. I yeah, I, I I thought you were going to say something else because they were spread geographically out of the whole of Ireland. They weren't coming exclusively out oh, of no, Dublin. No. no, they were spread over the whole of Ireland. Yeah, completely. But but they would like um, Francis Ledwich, Labourers yeah. Cottage in County yeah. Mead. You know, they, they, yeah. all the guys we know of. Yes. Yeah. 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 I think Ledwich as well did have something to do with a, 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 a refusal of marriage, or certainly of a. Oh, that could be too. Yeah, something yeah, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If memory serves from a lecture we had here one night, some of you might remember on Ledwich. 
So what are you going to do about housing? What would you like to do? Where is the oldest house? What? Where is the oldest house? Where is the oldest house? Where is the oldest house now? In Dublin? <coughs> God, that's a good question. It's, it's, it's one house in, uh, in uh, Thomas Street, reputed to be. I just saw an article about two or three years ago. Yeah. And uh, they claimed it was the oldest house. There's a number of the, there's a number of the houses in, 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 in Thomas Street uh, where standing and standing very close to where uh, that clothes shop was, a big long, big, big uh, shop. There's uh, no uh, one down there. Frogs. 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 As a building house, that would have been about 1700. I don't know if there's any houses going back into the 17th century still in Dublin. Or a How old is it? 17 something. 17 something. I thought we only got a Lord Lieutenant after the Act of Union. It was there beforehand for. Was it? Yeah, for. It was a large one, initially. Something like that, yeah. Yeah. There might be some. Yeah, when the ESB took over. The best Georgian <coughs> villages or houses in, in the world. The Twilliam Street, yeah. Down, but they left one. Yeah. Uh, I presume it's still there. Number 29. Yeah. Number 29, and it's a museum to yeah. the lifestyle. That's right. It's, it's there, there on the corner of yeah. Upper Mount Street, yeah. at the Twilliam Street. And now they have some plan to take away that 1960s the, the facade. To put a yeah. false Georgian the, front. Or a false thing. front. Yeah. yeah. To restore the, uh, the, the Georgian the model. The visual integrity. Yeah. 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 But again, back to what anybody's going to do about homelessness, and they just got to start building. They just have to start building. What about all the vacant houses? There are certain look. There are always going to be a certain few ba vacant houses. But in the last census, it was meant to be thirty-five thousand houses on the south side alone vacant. Really? And they're not holiday homes. They're vacant. Yeah, they're vacant houses. Yeah. So we have a huge amount of vacant houses. Yeah. Now I look at I, 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 you're right, and I don't know why they're vacant. And I tell you, I'm sitting on a vacant house myself at the moment, simply because I'm an executor of an estate. And the, the house the old dear died in is vacant until we get it sold. Yeah. And there are a good few houses around Dublin in that uh, condition. Yeah. It doesn't account for the 35 no. towns, but um, I, I simply don't know. And you have to remember too that all prop property rights are protected by the, by the Constitution. Constitution. Yeah. yeah. So they, they are absolute. Yeah. Take, a, take an nurse, awful lot to change. If you're in a nursing home, anybody's house, if they let that house out, the, gov uh, the fair deal will take 80% 80, 80 of the income from That's that right. because it's classed as that person's earnings. That's right. So yeah. I couldn't see a lot of people putting themselves in a landlord position for 20%. So a lot of the problem is that as well. Yeah. And that is part that of is the problem. That is a big problem. Yeah, so, 80%. so we're talking about the people, we're talking about the houses just after the people have died. And in the period before they died. Yes. And that certainly accounts for some of the vacancies yeah. they did say in your very day. Yeah. But the rest of them, you have to go through them house by house, and there'll be a different story to every one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? But Shine, so once again, thanks very much. We'll do something about it. Thanks very much on the wonderful lecture. Thank you. Yeah. Before we go, folks, we the last in the present series. Our next uh, our lecture series re recommences on September the 12th here, same time, same place. The first lecture in uh, the, the new season will be The Fountains of Dublin by Gary Brannigan. In the meantime, don't forget the trip. Switch back on your phones, etc. And all. You all have your summer holidays off now. This is the last day of school. You can all flock out there. Right. Have a great summer. Have a wonderful summer. Slam while you're safe home, teacher, every one of you. And we'll see you all here again in September. Please, God. Here again.